Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Now banks may have existed for what seems to be millennia, but unbeknownst to many of us, big changes are coming in the financial system. Changes for example in how money will be transferred among people in the future, changes in how money is to be stored in the system in the future. Now these changes are a result of what's happening developments in the world of decentralized finance or DeFi for short. Now to the question of how DeFi will affect us in the future, these are questions I pose to a gentleman named Hans Genberg, a professor of economics at the Asia School of Business in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, including getting his thoughts on central banking and how DeFi will affect central banking in the future. As always, if you find value in the conversations I have with the guests on this channel, please do consider subscribing, liking this video, leaving your comments in the box below. And now, dear viewers, may I present Professor Hans Genberg. Hans Genberg, Asia School of Business. Thank you for doing this. Now, the reason I guess we're discussing what we're about to discuss is the um, idea that um, what we're seeing in finance is, is fast changing, right? Uh, in the exchange rate world, in banking itself, um, the whole idea of economic theory and its fallacies underlying that. Um, we're going to discuss all those, but before we start, if I could, um, Hans, get you to explain to, 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 to us what is what it is that you do, and then uh, you know, uh, in in Malaysia. Sure. Well, thanks for having me here. Uh, I am uh, at the Acer School of Business, of course, and I am in charge of a Master of Central Banking program. It's a pro one year program for central bankers, and uh, we teach uh, every aspect of central banking. I'm also a professor of economics, so I teach economics also for MBA students occasionally. Okay, okay, good. So, so you spend a whole lifetime looking at this field and uh, things are really, really um, exciting right now or, 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 or threatening as, as the case might be. Um, let, let's start with this whole idea that bank, you know, there was a banking crisis. It's, it seems to have simmered down a little bit, but it's still percolating there, right? Uh, about how there's this idea that fractional banking as we know it um, might be under threat. The idea that uh, bank assets uh, are being threatened by Federal Reserve policy and the way interest rates are going and that whole uh, duration mismatch with their assets and how they've had to basically go out of business. I think we've had three or four banking uh, failures in the last essentially three months. Um, and this whole idea that um, deposits are, are leaving the banking system in America and, and they're going to other parts of the market. And there's all a whole bunch of repercussions there. But I want to get your views, Hans, on, on what this all means for banking firstly, and, and then for what it means for us in ASEAN, how, how we should address what's happening in this world. That's a wide-ranging question. But it is, it is. So let me, let me say something first about the US, the recent US banking crisis, if you call it the banking crisis, but the, the crisis in at least the three banks that went under. That was a lot because of lack of regulation of these banks. Uh, and you can also say it was a total lag of in, lack of internal control uh, about their investment decisions and also about their whole business model. If I take the Silicon Valley Bank, for instance, they were totally uh, focused on deposits from the Silicon Valley types of new startups. So they were very, very concentrated which meant that if uh, that group of uh, depositors lost confidence, they would leave immediately. So that was on, on, on uh, one side of the balance sheet. The other side of the balance sheet, the asset side, they, uh, the Silicon Valley Bank in particular, had long dated uh, treasuries on their, on their balance sheet, meaning that uh, they were uh, very sensitive to interest rate changes. So when the Fed tightened policies, uh, interest rate rolls, and the value of those securities fell. And there was no control, internal control about that. And therefore, they essentially became um, insolvent, partly because uh, the uh, depositors left very quickly as soon as they lost trust in the bank. Well, this is interesting because as a watcher of central banks um, for, for, your, for, for most of your lifetime, uh, Hans, this seems to me to be one of the um, manifestations of the problems of having a, a central banking system where a group of people 
um, for example, the Federal Reserve, they sit there and they discuss and they decide on A, the supply of money, and B, the price of money. And whatever they decide, um, if they make the wrong decisions, or they make decisions which are late or, or too early, it affects everything. And when you look at how the banking system is so systemic to the economy of the countries in which they operate, uh, if, they, if, the, if the central bank gets it wrong, there are severe repercussions because for the longest time, interest rates were low and they told the market it's going to stay low. Right. And, then, and, then, and then in their infinite ignorance, maybe, Jay uh, J, J Powell says, oh, we made the wrong call on inflation. We're late to the game. Let's let's raise interest rates by 500 basis points, essentially, in less than a year, which is yeah. unprecedented. There will be repercussions. There will be ramifications. So it's not as if those banks were poorly run. They were just playing ball along with what they thought the policy was, as communicated by the central bankers. Uh, I think that's a little bit hard on, on the Fed. Uh, it, it's true that they were... But they were... got it wrong, didn't they? They they got it wrong, but so did many others. So it's not that they didn't. Uh, everybody else said uh, inflation is is rising. Some people did. Other people said, well, it's going to be temporary. We don't need to do do much. That's what the Fed said in the beginning. And and uh, you know, in hindsight, that was that was certainly wrong. At the time, one could argue that uh, they were not uh, totally out of touch with what's going on. But uh, nevertheless, banks are supposed to run, be run in such a way that they are, uh, they are hedged against uh, lots of possibilities. And, and uh, in particular, they're hedged against possible changes in policies. And they also should have been regulated so that uh, stress tested so that the uh, they uh, it would be known what would be the impact of a potential increase in interest rates. You can perhaps argue that uh, the, the interest rate increases should have been announced uh, more rapidly, more clearly that it's that they were going to rise uh, substantially, uh, but. You know, other banks didn't fail. Other banks didn't have that sort of uh, balance sheet, built-in balance sheet risk. So, uh, well, why why did it happen only to these three banks? Others b banks were affected. I agree. However, not to the same extent. So uh, there was something special about these. Well, there's a lot to unpack in what you just said, um, um, Hans, because the whole idea that you know, if you have essentially free money for something like 12 years right. in, in a row, yeah. um, you can't not expect asset prices and, and the cost of everything to balloon because you're, you're just flooding the system with money. So for them to expect that inflation would be transitory um, and, and short term and uh, not of meaningful uh, import was grossly a misinterpretation, right? The second thing is that these banks, I mean, operationally, they were reasonably well run. I mean, I think late last year in 2022, in fact, Silicon Valley Bank won Best Bank Awards at some shindig in, in America. So they were one of the best run banks in the country. Um, and they were buying assets which were deemed, still today, some of the most safe assets in the world, which are long dated US Treasury bills. But now it's, it seems that it's not really the case that they are safe. They're safe in the sense that it's unlikely that uh, Treasury will default. But now, now we're uh, so, in so a new game on will, that we too. Will be so discussing that. We'll talk about uh, yeah, that uh, yeah, yeah. at another point. Yeah, but yeah. but uh, they're they're not risk free in the sense of of uh, uh, not being subject to changes. Uh, in interest rates and how that would change the, the values of these assets. And that should have been taken into account, I think, by the management. And, and uh, you know, there has been, uh, there was recently a, a congressional hearing about uh, particularly Silicon Valley Bank where the, the CEO was skewered quite a lot by the senators, but okay, that's a political a political show to some extent. But I think also rightly so, they, they were not uh, they weren't uh, taking account of the risks associated with their particular uh, portfolio structure. Uh, 
And uh, having said that, there was uh, there's also been a lot of criticism of the, of the San, Francisco, San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank, uh, which is supposed to regulate the banks in California. And uh, they apparently, uh, according to what I read, did not flag this yeah. to the to the bank itself. Yeah, but um, um, but having said that, you, you know about um, flooding the market with liquidity, as you mentioned, the this is also where I think economists in general have not uh, come to a a conclusion of what the inflationary impact of the quantitative easing policy and the low interest rates. Uh, where many people kept saying that, uh, well, interest rates are low. Uh, we are, it's not creating inflation. The uh, inflation mechanism or the driving forces have changed over time. We don't need to worry about money supply growth and so on and so forth. So it wasn't like the Fed was totally out of touch with what some a reasonably large part of the economic profession said, no, you can argue that the economic profession was out of touch, but uh, maybe you can get to that at some point. Yeah, so this uh, this whole development is, 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 is huge. It's an edifice of moving moving parts. Sure. The conclusion of which will, won't reach its, its you know, its end point for, for a long time yet. But I want to bring the discussion to, to our region, ASEAN, yeah. right? And, and specifically the other uh, countries within ASEAN. Right. Um, in terms of how, what's happening in the banking industry and in this whole crisis in America helps to shape and inform the central banks in this region in terms of how they deal with what's going on, in terms of how the banks themselves must assess risk and, and, gov and the governance framework and um, whether or not the instruction that's happening as we, as we speak, mm. you know, it's it's a real time news event, and things are still changing as we speak, Hans. Right, How right. and whether banks and, and the central bank in Malaysia and around the region as well right. should adapt and th themselves to be more resilient against these things. Well, one thing about uh, you know about the, the was the Asian financial crisis now twenty five years ago, ninety seven ninety eight, and one consequence of that was that regulation in uh, the ASEAN region, Asia more generally, uh, became much more attuned to potential risks in the financial system, sort of interrelated risk, not, not risk necessarily just bank by bank, so-called micro surveillance, but also the macro surveillance, the macro uh, prudential policies, which means that you have you introduce policies that look at the interrelationships in the banking system. And so that was introduced much more in Asia than in other parts of the world. And that, and it rendered the system more resilient. And that's why, for instance, during the 2008-9 crisis, the Asian banks were not as affected by that as were US banks and uh, European banks. So I think the, the banks in this part of the world are, are more uh, resilient as a result of lessons they learned during the, they and the regulators learned during the, uh, yeah. after the Asian financial crisis. Yeah, I mean, certainly the Central Bank of Malaysia was also much more circumspect in the way they treated the industry. And right. a lot of the problems that happened with the global financial crisis in 2008, in terms of the exotic instruments, right. were not introduced in Malaysia, and therefore right. we're a bit more inured against those problems. That's but right. what I'm really discussing, you know, is, is maybe the whole existentialism of central banking itself, this whole idea that this is a central um, um, institution which which monitors the industry and its innovations and its, you know, the, the price and supply of money, which, as evidenced by America, has severe repercussions if the right decisions at the right time are not made. That is true. Are you looking at that in any specific uh, well, way? Wait, there, there is a discussion on a, and and there is a sort of a small part of economists, uh, the profession, where was, uh, that is arguing that. Uh, we should try to do uh, do away with central banks or have some other uh, other type of uh, monetary system uh, but you know at the end of the day you know somebody has to set the interest rates or somebody has to do something about uh, how you think about exchange rates other and you cannot just leave it to the to the market because uh, 
uh, what, what, uh, how does the market set the money supply, uh, for example, that is appropriate for a country? How does the market uh, react to financial disturbances that are going to happen no matter what? And I, I, I don't think one can, one can have imagined really a system without central banks. So people, some people say, oh, let's have a gold standard or let's uh, have uh, some decentralized system based on bitcoins or something. But that doesn't get to the problem of, of how you deal with situations which uh, come about endogenously from some to time. I mean, it's sort of internal to the financial system generates maybe asset bubbles or, or the, 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 the equivalent on the downside. That needs to be dealt with by some authority. Well, the, the, the problem with that idea, Hans, is that the problems we are facing now are off the Fed's main you know, uh, decisions in the past. I mean, the fact that we now have this fallout is, is because of 12 years of really, you know, free free money. And it's, it's basically been this whole boom and bust cycle for the last, I can't remember how many decades, right? And it's become predictable in some sense because, because you know, the markets and economies now operate not so much on fundamentals, but on liquidity, or on the lack of liquidity, and, and, it's so, and so on and so on and so on, right? And this whole idea that there's a trust deficit with central authorities now means that there's been a, an exodus of money to alternative um, uh, homes or refuges, whether it's gold or whether it's Bitcoin or whether it's this idea that central banks don't, don't, don't make the right decisions for the, for the masses. Um, and that's why we've got this whole existential threat that is going on right now. Well, let me push back a little bit. I, mean, uh, we, 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 uh, I agree we have a, whether we call it a crisis right now or, or some other word, that we have inflation that is much higher than anybody would like it to be. But the previous 20 years looked pretty reasonable from the point of view of price stability. Now you might say, well, uh, there were there were underlying financial excesses that were driven in part by by central bank policy, and uh, that was bound to give rise to the kind of situation we have now: bank failures and so on and so forth. Uh, well, now then I'm going to push back again and say. If it was so predictable that it was going to uh, uh, to end this way, why did some banks not take account of that? Because a lot of money, a lot of people, shareholders lost money. Yeah. And if it was predictable, they shouldn't have. Yeah. So part of the also the the, the issue with, with the banking system is this idea that fractional banking, right? Sure. Whereby if 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 a bank takes in yeah. you know ten dollars of deposits, they lend out nine and they only keep one dollar on That's their correct. balance sheet as yeah. you know as 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 a pool of, of funds in case depositors want to recall their funds at any point in time. Right. But ninety percent of the money is no longer there; it's been lent out, and right. you've got this whole you know money velocity thing that keeps the economies going. But right, right. When you have a run of the system, as we, what we saw earlier yeah. this year, yeah. there is no cash to back it up. And some of the small banks who are not protected by federal deposit insurance, you know, right. went under because they, ju they just didn't have the funds to give depositors back. Then only the big banks, whether it's Wells or JP right. or one of these guys, yeah, yeah, BOFA, yeah. Bank of America, they are protected by FDIC. So, so then there's this whole uneven application of the system and you are protected in this in certain sense, but you're not protected in that sense. But the small banks in America, they run the economy. They're the ones who, who fund middle America. They're the ones who, who fund Main Street, you know, in, right. in some large yeah. part. So again, yeah, I mean, within the system itself, there are structural flaws which maybe can and should be addressed. Well, there, there are, I wouldn't necessarily call it structural flaws. I would say there are, there are fault lines uh, that uh, you have to be aware of and you have to uh, guard against. And that's why we have banking regulation for uh, that to protect against banks having uh, balance sheets which are that are. Uh, risky in a sense that are they might 
uh, end up, a bank might end up being insolvent as a result of certain developments in the global market, certain monetary policy decisions, and uh, therefore uh, we have regulations to make sure that banks don't uh, don't enter into that sort of situation. And we have de deposit insurance to um, generate more trust in banks. But so that's that the problem, right? The afflicted banks, in some sense, because of Fed policy, which made a big about turn in a very short amount of time, were not protected by federal deposit insurance. Uh, so, so uh, not, uh, they were protected up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars per deposit. Yeah, and, but and, uh, but not enough in totality. I mean, what they had in reserve was not enough to to fund a, a, a mass, you know, call on on deposits, which is why a lot of them went under, and a lot of deposits when uh, a lot of customers. Or, or, or assets went to the big, to the big right. banks, and the big got bigger, yeah. and the small got rented, rented the center. True, and, and that's uh, uh, that. Of course, is a concern that that smaller banks, uh, or put it, let me back off. That bigger banks are thought to be too big to fail, and therefore they have essentially deposit insurance for all all their deposits, where small banks yeah. are still subject to to the, the 250,000 yeah. limit or whatever limit happens to be in a country. Uh, so, and hence there is a discussion about should should deposit insurance not be in, unlimited? Okay, so, so let's, but, let's, let's humanize the discussion now, right? Can you, Hans, blame people for losing faith in some small sense with the system and how it might not look after their best interests? And how, how can the institutions you know, claw back some of this. I mean, you can see the same thing happen in, in ASEAN, in Malaysia, right? Depositors are not loyal to their banks as as, as people might be of the cars they drive, right? If, if you own mm. car A, you, you're very loyal to that car brand, right? right? But Malaysians, depositors are not loyal to their bank because it's a commodity and they just get the sense that the banks don't treat them as human beings. So, so... So, so it's all it's all related, right? And and they read the people can read what's happening in America. Sure. People can see what's happening on the internet. It's a globalized world. How can banks and how can central banks regain some of this trust in the system in which they're operating? Well, I think the central banks, uh, their mandate, first of all, is uh, there are basically two things: to to to. Uh, uh, ensure price stability, however we define that, and to uh, secure financial stability. Now, the problem with central banks now is they have lost some credibility in terms of inflation control. They uh, are trying very hard to get that cr credibility back, and if they do, I think they the, the, the central banking world will gain more, will regain some of the credibility that they have lost. Uh, how do they uh, protect their credibility in terms of financial regulation? I think there the Fed will have to think very hard about whether they did what they were supposed to do in, in, the, um, in the case of the Silicon Valley banks and the others that went under. Did they, uh, had they regulated them properly? And if not, uh, what should they do going forward? And in the discussion there is also the, the, the part about extending deposit insurance uh, to smaller banks that without having this total limit but but one has to be careful with that too because if you know that uh, a bank uh, your deposit in a bank is secured by the government no matter what then uh, you don't worry about whether that bank is solvent or you don't worry if that bank offer you interest rates on the deposit on the deposit which seem to be way above what the other banks do. They must be taking too much risk and uh, to be able to afford to give you those uh, higher interest rates. So this is the so-called moral hazard issue. Do you think banks should de de uh, couple themselves from you know the financial markets um, and and this whole you know uh, holy grail of quarterly profits and year-on-year -year growth and all that because 
That, to me, seems to be part of the problem behind why banks take on the risk that they do. Um, yeah, half a century ago, banks were never this size. They never did these kind of products. They certainly never took these kinds of risks. Mm. And they were basically, you know, funders to the economy. And uh, that's what they did. And, you know, you, you had your friendly neighborhood banker who knew everybody in town. Right. And that's what they did. And uh, suddenly, oh, I don't know, something happened. And in the last 40 years, um, they've become these huge monoliths of, of profit and, and to some extent greed. I think that that is a um, a consequence of finance and business more generally, that uh, profit motives and through and evaluations through stock markets, for example, is uh, is uh, driving decisions to a large extent, and therefore. Uh, banks cannot decouple themselves because then somebody else is going to come up with a with a financial sort of model which replicates what bank did they don't call themselves banks but they deposit will flow there and you're going to have the same sort of uh, issues being raised in relation to those new institutions that's a little bit what what's happening with fintech uh, companies. Uh, they are uh, some of the business that banks traditionally have made have moved over to some fintech type of operations where which are driven more by sort of machine learning algorithms uh, and so on in terms of their lending decisions and investment decisions to some extent. Yeah, and th so, that um... uh, uh, you know, banks will have to compete with that if they want to s stay in business, and uh, I'm sure they do. you're looking at some degree of interest with what's happening in the decentralized finance world, where um, transactions uh, are being conducted peer to peer um, right. among people all over the world. Yeah. Um, in cryptocurrencies, where I can send, you know, crypto to some guy in some part of the world without the need of a clearinghouse or a central bank or permission. It's permissionless. It's on the blockchain. It's provable. And uh, this whole thing has been gathering momentum the last few years, number of years, and it, I think the entire market cap of the crypto world is something to the order of one and a half trillion dollars already, mm. um, and it's growing every year. So I guess that's partly the reason why um, central bankers themselves are, are feeling, I guess, a little hot because under the collar or, or some kind of existential threat because this new world of decentralized finance renders central banking and centralized institutions uh, a little bit extinct at, at this point in time. I don't know how it's going to pan out. I don't know whether they will survive. I mean, indications are that they will because it's, it's gained too much momentum. Um, and, and certainly in America, especially in Congress, there seems to be this idea that innovation must, in, in this area, be... Be, be, be stopped uh, because it's for a number of reasons, you know, threatening. Mm -hmm. But then other countries around the world, whether it's, whether it's in the Middle East or in the UK, for example, they've taken on this whole mantle of innovation in the crypto world. And this is the whole idea that regulatory arbitrage is going on. Some other jurisdictions are more open to the idea. So again, linked to what you say with what's happening in the central banking world and the, and the financial world, this is parallel universe is happening. Then it's happening whether or not we like it. What do you think yeah, about that? Uh, yeah, I think there are two aspects of what, what you're describing. One is the crypto part. The other one is sort of decentralized or, or uh, fintech, financial technology uh, uh, innovations uh, and peer-to-peer and, uh, -peer lending. You can do peer-to-peer -peer lending in your favorite fiat currency. You can do it in dollars, you can do it in ringgit and, and uh, whatever. Uh, you don't have to use cryptos. So I, I think one could, one could separate it. And uh, for the, uh, sort of the part which deals with innovations in financial intermediation, so how savings goes from households to firms, uh, that's traditionally done by, by uh, banks. That can be done more and is being done uh, more either peer to peer or through uh, new new firms which uh, operate in niche markets. They take uh, deposit in some ways 
and they lend, but the lending is done using machine learning tools to assess risks and so on and so forth. That, 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 that's one aspect. And that putting pressure on, on banks because they can be more, these institutions can be more efficient uh, and uh, because they use technology. And then the other part is the, uh, the crypto. Uh, the, the crypto part uh, where you can, uh, you can send money uh, across borders, across to, between individuals, uh, not using fi fiat currencies, but, but these cryptocurrencies. That's, a, uh, I think, to me, th th that has an aspect of um, wanting to be anonymous in a system where, and wanting to avoid regulation. And I think, uh, not that I, I don't know the, the statistics on this, but you know, sometimes what one reads is a lot of the crypto transactions are are between individuals who are not necessarily following the law. Yeah, so certainly I, I do think that there's an element of, of camouflage there right. and illicit activity. But I think in the last couple of years, it's become much more mainstream and, and, and market acceptance by non-illicit participants because they feel that the, the fiat world, the traditional world, um, is is not for them anymore, and and I mean as we speak now, this whole idea that the debt ceiling in America may or may not be raised again, and I think of course my sense is that it will be raised. But the, the fact is, America is creaking under something like thirty one trillion dollars of debt, of which two thirds of it has really been incurred in the last twenty years, in the last three presidencies, yeah. right? Yeah. So people don't trust in the almighty dollar anymore. Um, and certainly when, when you keep printing it, and you might soon again be starting to print with QE, you can, I, th I think in some sense you can't blame people for having this disdain with fiat. And part of the reason why this is whole exodus to, to non-fiat is, is, is exactly those reasons. Uh, yes, but that... Um... How does America get out of this $31 trillion of debt, Hans? Can it ever? Uh, the... the, the uh... The absolute number is not so important, is not as important as the relationship with that debt to the total GDP. So the debt to to GDP. Uh, if if uh, you have thirty one trillion relative to uh, you know the the size of the GDP, it's now much higher than it uh, than it used to be historically. However, it can come down if you grow enough. If GDP yeah. increases faster than than the uh, the increase in debt, so uh, you can get out of the problem in that way. To have a large amount of outstanding debt, if you're a large economy, is not a big big problem in and of itself. It's it's uh, the trajectory that is important. That you don't you, the that ratio is not increasing in an unsustainable fashion. If the supply of the dollar, uh, the rate of the increase in the supply of the dollar surpasses the rate of the increase in the US economy right. every year consistently for the next 10 years, then I think you'll know the answer to that question, which is no, it can't. The percentage of, of debt to GDP will keep on rising. Um, I think the US yeah. economy is something to the tune of $21, 22000000000000 trillion, right, right, right. and the size of the debt is $31 trillion. Yeah. What, is the, what is the rate of growth of the US economy? Something to 3 to 5% a year, if best of years, right? right. Typically 2 to 3, right? Yeah. The, the increase in the in the rate of the supply of the dollar in terms of the printing presses, something like six or seven percent, if if what I remember is is correct. Yeah, but that's not that's not written in stone, right? That uh, you don't it doesn't have to increase by that amount per year. It's a political political issue of whether the uh, fiscal authorities can uh, come to a a. a uh, sort of agreement that uh, we should not have fiscal deficits that are too large. It's also a question of what the interest rate on the debt is. If the interest rate is, is very large relative to the growth rate of the economy, then the, 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 just by rolling over the debt, or by, by paying interest on the debt, sorry, you have the debt growing essentially at the rate of 
the same rate as the interest rate because that's how you, what you have to pay in interest. And so it's an important uh, relationship between the growth rate of the economy and the interest rate uh, that uh, is paid on the, on the federal debt or the government debt. Hans, what is your sense of the status of the US dollar as the world's reserve currency? Does it keep it or does it deserve to lose it? Um, well, I'm not that, uh, whether it deserves to lose it is a, is a sort of a loaded question. Well, uh, we well, have to think of what is the alternative. Yeah, okay, and there are, in, in some sense, alternatives being mooted and in fact being practiced around the world, which we will discuss after this, right? Yeah. Um, a la the, the, the Russians, the Chinese, and their alternative ways of, of trading with, with each other. Right. Um, Non-dollar, of course. Yeah. But, um, you know, when, when you have the U.S. economy and the U.S. government um, printing the U.S. dollar like it's, you know, like it's going out of, of, of fashion because they, they have the, the status of the world reserve currency and then they weaponize the U.S. dollar in terms of its military conflicts around the world and how it wants to exert its, its strength and maintain its, its power, then it becomes a problem. Yeah, but wait, so let's depack that a little bit. Uh, the, the reason why interest rates are high in the U.S. is that they want to stop the de uh, stop the 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 economy from uh, needing to be supported by by uh, low interest rate and therefore high uh, growth of debt. Uh, so th that that part of it can, uh, in my view end the the question is will other uh, parts of the world want to continue to using to use the dollar uh, in trade in uh, financial uh, financial uh, re relationships that has to do with the size of uh, and the resilience and liquidity of the US financial market or the dollar uh, market for financial assets which is way larger than any other uh, financial markets. How does, so, how does ASEAN deal with what's happening now, with this whole theme of de-dollarization? Uh, especially since this part of the world is very much export dependent right. and does business with the rest of the world. How does a small country, you know, whether it's Malaysia or Thailand or even yeah. you know, the Philippines, smaller at least, you know, deal with what's happening in this in these exchange rate regimes? How does it adapt to fit two systems? Well, I think to a large extent there's still one dominant system, and yeah, that's, uh, that's a dollar. But to prepare for the future, where it seems to me there's more momentum on one and less momentum on the other. So th there is, uh, uh, there, there are so two, two developments uh, that I can see. One is uh, settlements between, bilateral settlements, bilateral trade between Malaysia and Thailand can be uh, conducted in, in local currencies. And uh, so on a gross basis, on a net basis, of course, it has to be settled in something. And uh, if it's settled in something, what should that be? What, what does the, the bank, bank of Thailand want if, uh, if they have an excess of ringgit? Do they want renminbi? Do they want real? Do they want ruble? I don't think so. They want dollars. Why? Because dollars can be used to trade with Africa, to trade with Europe, to trade with the U.S. The ruble cannot. Well, ruble is a separate, but the, the ringgit, I mean, the, the renminbi can be used very well to trade with China, but a lot less well to trade with uh, Latin America, with Europe. So the dollar in that sense, as a settlement, I think will will uh, remain, and therefore a lot of trade will be done denominated also in dollars. Uh, having said that, so as I start, I started out saying there might be more sort of gross trade settlements in local currencies, partly because of um, the the um, technology of pay, payment technology is now such that this can more easily be handled. So the second thing is that uh, China is trying, I think, to 
promote to some extent the, the renminbi as a regional currency. And that might, there might be some more of that. But again, I think the, 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 the issue there is the following. Suppose uh, there is a trade relationship between, um, there, there is of course a trade relationship between Malaysia and China. And suppose um, the, the Chinese um, are, uh, have a surplus of ringgit in, uh, in their balance of payments with, with uh, Malaysia. Are they going to be willing to hold the ringgit? If they don't, what do they want from Malaysia? They can say, we give you, we want, we want uh, you to, to send us, we give you some, some, uh, your ringgit back, we want the RMB back. So maybe that's, uh, that's um, something that will happen because they have sort of central bank relationship. Suppose that you have the reverse, that uh, the Malaysia, Malaysia won't have more ringgits because they've exported so much to China, then, then uh, more renminbi because of exports. Do we want to hold renminbi? Well, I think the question really is, is what supplants, if at all, the US dollar as the world's reserve currency? Um, a lot of people are suggesting that the renminbi might be, or at least a basket of currencies which include the renminbi, might be that. And you can that. see that happening with, with I think, in the last that. few months, I think something like 50 or 60 countries have signed up to a non-dollar denominated trade system where they're dealing with each other, with each other and settling in their, their respective currencies. So there seems to be this tectonic shift away from the dollar, henceforth, this yeah, whole discussion yeah, right but, now. But, but uh, I don't see that happening on uh, yet on a large scale. <laughs> simply be, uh, because uh, you're not going to settle uh, in, in small currencies. Right? Of course, too, too uh, you, small. You're, too you're, you're going to settle in some international currency. What sort of characteristic much such an international currency have? It must be freely tradable. And you must have financial markets uh, available so that you can hedge the exchange rate risk, which is all, will always be there uh in in a floating exchange rate world and uh the renminbi for the time being is does not have financial it has large financial domestic financial markets but not uh international financial markets which allow you to readily hedge the foreign exchange risk that is associated with holding balances of of renminbi in your in your reserves for example so Having looked at this whole industry for the last know, 40 years, Hans, um, how do you think, you know, what's been happening ends up? How, how does the world picture in, in finance and exchange rates look in, look in say, 5, 10 years' time? Because clearly something is happening. Clearly there are structural flaws. Clearly there is a, a movement of liquidity from one area to another. Clearly human, you know, social acceptances are shifting significantly. How do you think it all, you know, how do you think the world looks like in five, ten years time? You know, I, uh, w w when you say that clearly things are, are changing, I wonder to what extent is that, is that uh, a reflection of the kind of problems we've seen in the last two, three years? Uh, suppose the US economy goes back to an inflation rate of two, three percent, stability, interest rates uh, aren't, you know, they're two, three, four percent. <throat> and uh, the financial system is okay in the US. Are we going to still say this system needs to be fixed? It's, there's something wrong with it. I think it's, uh, I'm not convinced. Maybe I'm too, uh, uh, too stuck in my uh, in my views uh, and and not paying much uh, enough attention to financial innovations and, uh, or payments innovations. And, but those payments innovations, I think, uh, I I don't believe that it's going to come from the crypto world. Uh, I, I think that the crypto world is um, 
cannot live on its own. It's always going to be linked to some fiat currency at the end of the day. For no other reason, if for no other reason that, uh, you know, you have to pay taxes in something. And I, I doubt governments are going to say we accept bitcoins or any other cryptos. And, and, and uh, the Bitcoin uh, of, the world, of the world, they are too volatile to become really a, a money. Then you have the stable coins, but they are stable because they're linked to a fiat currency. So you still need that backing at the end of the day. And for that to be stable, you need central banks. So I don't think I don't see how that, how that can change. What what can change uh, and uh, is that uh, something uh, a currency like the renminbi will become more important first regionally here in Asia because of the trade linkages. And if they in in China, if um, they take the decision to liberalize controls on capital movements and and integrate more fully, uh, allow countries to integrate more fully financially then it can become a regional uh, sort of reserve currency or regional uh, trade denomination currency to a large, much larger extent than it is now. And that could then lead to a, initially some sort of uh, bipolar exchange rate system where in Asia, much of Asia, the renminbi is important, and that could also link to the Middle East. Uh, Saudis are talking about uh, trading in, in um, renminbi or denominating oil in, in renminbi. That, that could happen. And I'm not saying that the dollar will always be there for, forever. I mean, we've seen in the past the, the British pound used to be dominant, and, and when, um, when uh, the U.S. became the dominant economy, then the uh, U.S. dollar took over as a world currency, <laughs> yeah, uh, part, and that uh, could happen again. Yeah, of course, uh, there have been global reserve currencies in the past, prior yeah, sure. to the pound, there was the Dutch Gilder and, That's right. and all that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I, I think there, uh, what, what, what is important is the importance of, of the country will determine whether it becomes a, uh, its currency becomes uh, reserve currency or the dominant Correct. currency. It's not the other, not that the currency Correct. leads Correct. to an important Correct. country. The and that, is but the mere financial manifestation that's right. of the health of the, of the underlying country. That's right. Okay. Exactly. So, so, so the thing is, your 10 year crystal ball sounds to be the most plausible, um, some kind of in between, you know, common ground between what's happening right. between the, 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 the comp competing systems of, of the world. Yeah. Um, but there are a lot of assumptions in there, you know, that inflation yeah. comes down, yeah. the system's fine, you know, the economy continues to chug along. But demonstrably in America, it, it's not as healthy as, as it seems, right? Um, certainly with in terms of just the employment numbers, yeah, it seems as if there is a lot of employment in America, that everybody's got a job, wages are going up. But there's a lot of people who are not in meaningful jobs who are not being countered by the surveys because they've just fallen off the radar. I mean, if you look anecdotally, when you go to one of some of the big cities in America, there's, there's tons of homeless people living in their cars, living on tents, talking about San Francisco, talking about LA, talking about, you know, uh, Portland and so on. At least a couple of dozen cities in America have got thousands of homeless, many of whom haven't been counted by the census, census board <clears throat> because they've just fallen off the cliff in terms of um, measurability. So, so, so on to economics, right? and specifically macroeconomic data, which of course you do look at things like employment numbers, things like jobs data, things like CPI inflation, things like um, GDP for that matter as well. There's this idea among you know industry people that macroeconomics is not an accurate barometer of the health of an economy, for one, and for another, the policymakers have, have captured um, um, you know economic data to, to seek out you know, political um, uh, obje objectives. So there seems to be this whole idea that macroeconomics as a field is, is inaccurate, it's, it's behind the curve, it's, it doesn't, you know, um, capture the right data for policy makers to, to make the right decisions about how to guide the country. What are your views on that? The uh, you know, macroeconomic, let, let, me, let me focus first on central banks. And, and then we can go more broadly. Uh, central banks have 
most central banks have a, an objective of price stability. And uh, they try their best and, and they were pretty successful until, until a couple of years ago. And I hope that they will be as successful again uh, in returning to some measure of price stability, inf low inflation. Now, is that enough? No. That is not enough for uh, the for an economy to be economy to be uh, flourishing for the population to uh, be fully employed and in, in, and for homelessness to go away uh, and so on. the The problem, I think, is that central banks are ill equipped to deal with those other other issues. So uh, those other issues like inequality, which is uh, very important, certainly important in the United States, but I think in, in most countries, um, not to speak about climate change, which is an issue that we haven't talked about, but that, that, that is a whole issue that the central banks have been drawn into, but they don't have the tools. And they don't have the tools necessarily to deal with, with um, uh, inequality uh, and um, some other aspects of society or macroeconomics that are not functioning well. Uh, and this is a issue of, I think, an issue of government policy more generally. How, do, how should a society deal with uh, homelessness, inequality, huge inequality between, between uh, segments of population, between regions? And um, that's part of the taxation system. And here, if we talk about the United States, uh, I think it's the dysfunctional. Yeah, the politics so you've, just, and the, you've, you've just captured the American problem in, yeah. in two or three very succinct lines. So then if you measure the, the health of the U.S. economy versus the relative health of the Chinese economy, you can see that they're moving two different speeds in two different directions. Which can be troublesome, uh, which has shown to be troublesome, which is why the Americans and the Chinese seem to be not get along, getting along too well. And that's why we're having these issues, at least in some small part on the geopolitical stage. Uh, the issues between China and the U.S. are, uh, they are very deep and, and uh, it's partly as a result of, I think, domestic politics in both countries that uh, the leaders are leaders uh, and uh, have be you know they, they draw their base from promoting their own country and how much they're doing from their own how much they are fighting the other country i think that is unhelpful and i i wish it weren't that way um and uh but i think just within the united states itself i can think of horror uh, scenarios in the next election, which would lead to even worse problems. You're talking about the possible re-election of Donald Trump. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> which, and, uh, which, of course, is in the future. Uh, uh, but I mean, and, and that goes beyond economics. It goes into sort of social structures, uh, the 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 um, the trust in institutions, the uh, and so on. And I think that could lead to a uh, unraveling unfortunately, of the US, uh, U.S. society. That sounds very yeah. dramatic, but I, I don't think it's necessarily uh, uh, an impossibility. So do you see a shift in power between, well, from the U.S. to China as widely expected? And what does that mean for this, rest, this, this part of the world? Uh, inevitably, China is going to become more and more important uh, as it grows. And... Uh, I I don't know enough about internal politics in China to to be able to sort of predict much about the future. But just to say that uh, there was a time when Japan was thought to take over the world in terms of economics and power. That didn't happen. Maybe Japan is too small a country, sort of, geographically for that ever to have been a, a possibility. Uh, but, you know, uh, internal politics in China 
will determine whether it will become a stable society and uh, which will be highly respected internationally over time. And if that happens, then, of course, given the size of the economy, it's going to become an important uh, sort of force economically in the, in the global economy, starting with Asia, but more generally. Yeah, just to switch back to what we're talking about, about uh, macroeconomics, right? Right. And this whole, um, I mean, this whole sense that a lot of it is possibly inaccurate or behind the curve, and it, it you know, it has an, a tangible effect on policy and, and misdirected policy as, as a result of inaccurate data, right? How do you think economics evolves to, to better reflect what's happening in, in true picture? Should there be a shift, for example, from macroeconomic data to microeconomic data, where you're studying specific price movements on specific items as a more accurate barometer? I think to some extent that is already happening in the economics uh, field. Uh, professional economists are looking increasingly at at um, sectors uh, as opposed to the economy as a whole, using, and this is driven to to a large extent by the availability availability of more and more data, so-called big data. Uh, sources that uh, can be then used with machine learning tools, with other uh, traditional tools to to eke out how the economy is actually functioning. But at the end of the day, we also need to see how these sectors are linked to each other. We cannot just look at the auto sector and try to study that in isolation. We can, but we, we don't get the big picture. So we need some sort of macroeconomics to to understand the linkages between the various sectors of the economy, between various manufacturing services, labor, financial, and how that all sits together. And fair enough, uh, economic models have been very stylized, the sort of the, uh, the the mainstream macroeconomic models are very stylized and haven't really gotten to grips with with uh, heterogeneity across sectors and across individuals and that is coming but uh, it's slow and 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 then there's a uh, there's more and more writings about the the role of government that uh, as opposed to what uh, what Ronald Reagan said, the government is a problem. Uh, now a number of uh, writers, influential ones, are saying, well, no, the government can do and does well important in important sectors from time to time. So, but there is this tension. How do you uh, how do you make sure that the government uh, regulations are not too uh, to, too restrictive for fi for uh, the private sector to flourish versus too lax so that there's uh, sort of a free for all and and uh, uh, you get the kind of outcomes in terms of inequality and and so yeah. on that that we see. Well, the problem with politics and democracy is that uh, politicians and the policies they underwrite is uh, are traditionally demonstrably uh, inflationary in nature because they're meant to win popularity contests, not necessarily what's good for the people or the economy. Yeah. Uh, and if we do see a return of Donald Trump, that has, again, you know, different consequences for the US economy sure. and how it deals with China and trade and the rest of the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So unless we change that system as well, or at least evolve it, yeah. I mean, certainly what you, what, you know, from your home part of the world, Sweden, and whole Scandinavian uh, style of government, I think there's something there to be said, although it's not as, you know, freewheeling as the American economy in terms of innovation and entrepreneurialism, there are significant benefits to the people at large in, in you know, the Scandinavian countries. That's right. Um, but we don't see that, you know, in, in, in the US, for example. We don't see that in the UK. Certainly, we would love to see more of that in Malaysia, but we don't because policies and politicians tend to introduce policies which are good for staying in power, not That's necessarily right. what's good for the country. That's right. I, mean, I think that that is a, that is a problem in yeah. in some countries and uh, well, probably in most countries. 
that's uh, what uh, and, and maybe that's why uh, one needs for example in the United States, States to have time limits on how long you can be a senator or a congress person representative yeah i mean if you look at the average age of the you know the men and all the women in congress yeah. it is an order of magnitude something like 10 to 20 percent uh, older than what you might see in say in new zealand or right, Canada, right. oh yeah no which that's, is a problem uh, that because, is a problem i agree yeah that for sure so so let's let's end the conversation hans with with how you know us in little old malaysia and in asean um you know kind of like adapt itself on ourselves even on an individual basis to deal with this world which is moving so fast and uh, sometimes it seems as if we have even gotten to grips with Internet 2.0 and now there's Internet 3.0 <laughs> and there's AI and GPT and all these right. generative AIs that are coming on which is just happening at this uh, speed. How, how do we deal with that? Oh, that's a million dollar question yeah, or yeah. a million ringgit question. Individually uh, as well as at a government level. How, how do you think we should view this? In which prism? Well, I think um, from from uh, sort of a very narrow point of view, sitting here at the Asia School of Business, I think a business school like like ours, a school like ours, we can uh, provide education uh, possibilities uh, that are adapted to the new environment. Meaning, we have to we have to look at. Our programs are they are they fit for purpose in terms of of providing uh, students with the the right tools and mindsets to to function in an economy which is constantly changing and a world which is constantly changing. I think that is one one um, area, and and I think we are. Uh, it's uh, something that uh, the the, cur the new CEO Sanjay Sarma is very uh, passionate about, and um, uh, we're, we're moving in that direction. Uh, so that, of course, from a very fairly narrow point of view, but uh, more generally, I think uh, we need to be um, as a, as countries. Uh, we cannot become insular. Uh, by saying the world is too complicated, we're going to try to do things our own way and, and uh, uh, limit our inter interaction with the world. We have to deal with it, we have to, uh, but we have to understand the risks associated with financial linkages, for example. Uh, that, that goes back to the question, are our financial systems, are they resilient enough? And that uh, like it or not, it, it comes down to to uh, regulations uh, of the of the system, and we ne we need to be vigilant about uh, again, on the one hand, encourage innovation, but on the other hand, making sure that that those innovations don't create risks on on their own. Uh, I realize fully that these are very general uh, general uh, answers to your question, but it's of course. Uh, um, uh, as the saying goes, we're living interesting times, and and but I think we do have to to be open to new ideas. We have to we have to um, uh, sort of observe what is going on, try to internalize the best the, of of these new systems, and uh, also recognize that uh, everything new is not necessarily going to uh, end up well. Okay, man. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your time, Hans. Thank you. I don't know if that was uh, very... That was a good um, analysis, I think, and a good snapshot. So, yeah, good luck with the um, students, and I hope we do prepare ourselves for this very uncertain future. Thank you. Thank you. That was, that was kind of fun. <laughs>